as it says, this is uh, not a general prepping course. It is just the aspects of apartments uh, into prepping. And living in an apartment is not the best option for prepping, but it, for some of us, it's the best option to, for living. How many are living in apartments? Okay, so there is some interest then. Okay, first topic is inside access versus outside and the number of stories. There's some difference in approach because inside access means you're hidden away. Not everybody can see except the apartment dwellers. If it's outside access, everybody on the street can see what you're, you're hauling in those 55 gallon drums. So it's, uh, you have to think about those things when you are moving equipment, depending on if you live on an outside access, inside access. It's easier to keep a low profile inside because in my apartment building anyway, there's not a lot of interaction between residents. Okay, choice of floor. I, when I moved in, I was fortunate enough to get a third floor. That's the top floor, which is what I wanted. Everybody tried to talk me into the first floor because I have disabilities. I did one on the first floor. I've seen too many buildings pancaked. I wanted on the top floor so I, if necessary, I could write it down. Besides that, uh, power goes off here in town, sewer system shuts down, that first floor becomes a septic tank because people will continue to try to flush if there's water, even though the sewers aren't working. And a lot of people know how to flush a toilet with uh, a bucket of water, uh, which if there's nowhere for it to go, it's gonna come up in the tubs and the toilets on that first floor. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one of the, another reason I avoid it. And even, on the, even if you're on an upper floor, you have to think about if that does happen, you gotta go through that mess getting out, in and out. So it's uh, later on, it comes up again as part of the bug out. Nuclear problems, uh, mostly for fallout. If in an apartment building, if you're on an upper floor, or an in-between floor, you have some protection. If you're on the very top floor, or the very bottom floor, you get stuff coming down on the top floor, stuff coming from the sides on the, that's on the ground on the first floor. So I, I do recommend uh, one of the middle or the very top floor, unless it's a really tall building. Then, uh, how are you gonna get your stuff up there, 14 flights? It's not gonna happen. So stay below five floors, because for fire protection and uh, usability. If uh, safety, uh, you can get out of a fire, usually uh, up to three floors with a, with a ladder, uh, one of the drop-down ladders, or uh, the fire department can get to you. If you're up there on the 14th or 15th or 25th, you've got a couple of options, but uh, they're both risky. You get one of those parachutes to bail out, which I'm not gonna do, and uh, various rope and belay systems that are on the market to be able to lower yourself down to, to the ground. But that's a risk that's preferred not to take. Now, during floods, I live one block away from the Truckee, and I feel relatively safe in a flood that I would not have to bug out. I could stay right where I am. Building is fairly well constructed. Now, if it was a raging flood, and it's a two-story apartment building, and it's uh, 80 years old, wood construction, I'd probably leave. But my building, it's something, again, it's something to think about. All of these things are, are references for each individual to think about in their own situation. My building has elevators, it, it has emergency stairs, but it does not have regular use stairs. So those stairs would be available if the power goes off, but myself, I'm bugging in unless I have to bug out because I'm not going up and down three flights, of or three flights of stairs to do go shopping. I've got what I need. Uh, there are ways to get heavy things up. If you do have to use a set of stairs, you can uh, use a, the old uh, coolie bucket 
on a pole, and uh, even better than that is uh, a, ca a canoe portage yoke, where they have the it's contoured to fix your shoulders, and it's fairly wide the white width of your canoe. If you cut that down, you can have buckets right or totes or whatever right here at hand level, so you can control them. But the weight is on your shoulders, so that's a good way if you have to carry much weight up or downstairs, that's a fairly good way. If not, uh, some cardboard and a rock and tackle. A deer hunter's uh, rope and tackle is usually adequate for one floor. It's usually stout enough to do it. And you can use that to pull stuff up rather than carrying it up. Uh, and if you do that, uh, you can also if you're on second or third floor, you can do stuff from your balcony if you have one, or a window even, to lift stuff up into the apartment that's he too heavy to carry up those flights of stairs. Now, parking. This is, comes back to security, that if you park outside, if it's a, a regular parking lot, that's just a regular parking lot like a lot of people have. So it is, uh, there's nothing much you can do about that. But if you're in an underground parking lot or a first floor parking lot like my building, if you park near the entrance all the time, you risk having people get to your vehicle, pilfer or whatever. But in case of problems, you do have access to it probably more so if the building doesn't pancake completely. Even though there might be problems with it, you can still get to it. Now what I do, I park, because mine has openings on other sides, I could maybe squeeze through or get a kid to go through for me and get some stuff out. Uh, so I park on the far side because I've already been broken into once. I don't want by the exit and entrance. So because I do have options, I park on the other side. Major word of caution, of course. If something does happen, that situation, even though you might have some stuff in the vehicle, you need to think very strongly, do you go in there to try to get it out? If you're in one of the buildings where it's gonna be high risk, it's better to go ahead and carry that bag up and down, or if you got an elevator, take it up with you and bring it down, because chances are, you have a chance to get into it, but you might not. If you got any critical things in your vehicle in, a, in an underground garage, it's something you have to think about. Uh, my building, I'm a little careful about what I stack up. My water, my totes, I spread them around the walls mostly. They are, uh, you have to be careful how much. I would not do anything larger than approximately 15 gallons or so stacked anywhere to prevent, uh, because once that, that weight, water is heavy, as you all know, and you don't want it out stacked in the middle of the floor, that's the weakest part of the floor. Do the heavy stuff around the walls. Now, also, space is in a premium in an apartment, and let me tell you, I live in a one bedroom, but it is a small one. My bed frame is a set of 20 totes. It has relatively lightweight stuff in them, that they're stacked up, my mattress is on, sits on those 20 totes, and I have a side table by my recliner where I watch television, is a stack of two totes, and then of course I have the totes lined up against the living room wall. Uh, they're on the open, anybody comes in can see them, but most of the people in the building already know I'm a prepper. The uh, staff definitely does, because they've been in there. but. You can do a lot of different furniture ideas, tables, benches, anything that where you have uniform totes or containers, you have some options there. But again, keep them next to the wall because that's, it is much better than out in the middle of the floor. If you do middle of the floor, make it lightweight. Neighbors. My neighbors, uh, there's a couple of really good ones there, I'll say. But most of them are not going to be any kind of asset to me in times of trouble. There are some that definitely will be a problem for me in times of trouble. 
So you've got to learn about your neighbors. Uh, good neighbors are an asset, but bad neighbors, uh, it goes anywhere from badgering you and complaining about it, asking for handouts. In worst case, they'll just kill you and take your stuff. So get to know your neighbors? Probably yes. Do you cultivate them? Not unless they have a similar mindset. So you just you really have to be careful. Now, when it comes to the actual prepping needs, I'm a believer in basic human needs come first. Water. Do what you can uh, as much as possible within the limits of your space and floor capability. But you need a reliable source of additional water. You need to scout out places where you around the apartment building somewhere where you can get additional supplies and you need the means to purify it or filter it at the very least, purify it preferably. So I would not do anything more than a 15 gallon drum in a house that's just too much weight in an apartment, on a multi-floor apartment building. So it's uh, it's one of those things that's you got to balance some things. You want all you can get, but you can't have too much. But that ex extra supply, I, like I said, I live a block from the Truckee. That is my primary alternate source. But I know two springs, where two springs here are in the city, that I can go to and get water. It will need to be filtered or purified. But I have alternate sources. And if you figure these sources, you'll need to have containers that you can get to the apartment, up to the apartment, and you'll need a way to get from where they are, where the water is, to where your apartment is. I have my game cart, as most people know. That is what I will use to haul my uh, five-gallon totes to go get it if I need it and bring it up. I will slap a, uh, got my rope on it. I will pull it up the stairs if I have to. Uh, one step at a time for me because that's all I can handle. Okay. Uh, Jerry, is a, is a two -wheel cart? It's a two-wheel cart. It's out in my truck actually if anybody wants to look at it. It's a game cart. You can get other types of carts that'll work almost as well as that or garden cart, whatever. But you will need some way to move it. You don't want to be carrying all of it by hand because it's just too much work. Uh, whatever type of filter you want to use that's, uh, that's pretty much standard stuff. I think we've probably covered that in a lesson or two. One of the things you do have to think when you've got to filter the water is do you go there, filter it there, and bring it back? Or do you go get the water, bring it back, and filter it at home? It's uh, another toss-up decision that has to be made. If you do the filtering there, it's going to take a while. You're going to be exposed. Uh, people will see what you're doing. They will know you've got fresh water, and it's a risk. If you get the raw water and take it home quickly, you're not exposed for very long, but then you need additional containers because you do not want to, raw water container has to stay as a raw water container. Your clean water containers have to be clean water. So you're kind of doubling up there that unless you empty one, and I mean thoroughly clean it with bleach, to use it as your next clean water, which is a lot of hassle. You can stack your buckets up empty and have plenty of buckets for handling your water. Uh, okay, if you, got, if you can do either one, if you're set up for either one, that's great. But figure out where you're going to get that water and decide one way or the other and plan for that. Food. Okay, super pails for us apartment dwellers usually aren't a good idea unless they are multi-element multi buckets. Uh, a bucket of beans, a bucket of rice, a bucket of wheat. That's too much stuff in an apartment at once. But if you vacuum pack or mylar seal a pound of wheat and a pound of rice and a pound of oats or whatever, and add these to a bucket. If you can work buckets in, that's fine, especially the square ones. If you can get square ones, then they stack a little bit easier. So, and of course, dehydrated and freeze-dried food is usually, or dehydrated is usually more compact, is 
Rob knows. He, do, he does some of that himself. Freeze dried, takes up a little more room, but it takes less water uh, to rehydrate. Now, there are some, uh, most people stock, well, most people don't stock very much meat because it's expensive. I'm a meat eater. I stock a lot of meat myself, both for eating and for trading to get the stuff that I don't stock. But there are some options here in town. None of them are legal, but it's something you might want to think about. There's pigeons, squirrels, a few rabbits, lots of geese, and you can use large rat traps, slingshots, blow guns. You've got a great system with yours uh, that you could easily take with that slingshot of yours, which I can't use, but it's highly effective. Uh, and anything silent to do it. So it's, uh, I, the traps for the big, uh, or the smaller, the smaller animals and, and birds, something like a goose, I have a net that I could use that you can, rather than trying to shoot it, chase it down or anything. These are relatively, at least now, you can get up close enough to, to do a, th a throw net to capture a goose. Again, it's highly illegal. Now you don't want to be, you want to think about it now, but you don't want to be doing it now. That's one of the things you can't practice. You can practice on your dog if you want to, but uh, I don't think the dog's going to like it very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we come to what I consider the third most important after water and food. That's sanitation and waste disposal. If the power goes off, if the water goes off, kind of check your drains. You might be able to use them, but I believe in the city it's all pump. It's not, it's not gravity flow, unless there are a few places that you may be gravity flow, but the ones downstream are not going to be. So you need alternatives to using your flush toilet. Uh, you can, like I said, if, the, if it is working, you can bucket flush, but you risk contaminating everybody below you with that if the sewer is not working, as I mentioned before. Uh, and even if you do, you don't care, you might have to walk through it yourself getting out because it's overflowed. As soon as the water gets off, switch to a separate or uh, a different means of waste handling. Bucket toilets, latrines, third tier preps, uh, I consider them third tier, as third tier as opposed to second tier because they're, they, no matter what you do, they're inconvenient, there's going to be some smell, uh, chemical toilet's my first line. I have one that sits in my bathroom out of the way. I got my some first aid stuff stacked up on top of it. So I pulled that out on the drill here a while back, the bug-in drill, and used that. Finish after the drill, I just, the you know, water back on, sewer working, I just dumped it in the sewer. It was done. So that is my preferred method. I think it's the cleanest, the least smelly, uh, most people can use those. They're closer to a flush toilet. They are a flush toilet and that you do flush it. It just contains the waste in that bottom compartment. Okay, now for a long term, that toilet, that chemical toilet might fill up or your bucket or whatever you're using. That if it's a dry bucket where you're using sawdust, moss, uh, anything like that, you can just uh, cap it off, stack it somewhere until you can get a chance to bury it. With a, with a chemical toilet, uh, you need a place to bury that waste fairly quickly because they do fill up. If you've got a family, they're only going to last so long before you have to dump it. Well, there's another option besides taking it out and burying it while the fallout's coming down or the riots are going on. You need to know where you're going to do that, though, in case you do have to scout out a place to bury waste. But there are some totes, usually for RVs, that are uh, sanitation or waste storage totes. They have wheels on them. Uh, you can get up to 42 gallon ones. So if you need additional waste storage space, human waste, you can transfer from that chemical toilet into one of these totes. And that gives you many more days 
of usability without having to go out and get rid of it if the, if the power in the sewer is still off. Uh, there's, you're going to have some gray water. You still have to do something with that. There's going to be a little bit more than that, so I'd, if you can get in a couple more of those for gray water, that's a good way to, uh, you got your, your wash basin on the uh, countertop. You can pour that wastewater into one of those totes. If the sewer does happen to still be working, you can use that water to flush with, even if the water's off, if that sewer is working. When they're full, like I said, dump them in a working sewer, take it to an RV dump station, which you still should be able to access if the riots are over and the fallout stopped. Uh, then otherwise, you have to bury it. Have the tools you need to do it. Basically, a shovel. In a lot of places around here, you're going to need a pick as well to get down deep enough. You want to bury it at least two feet deep. Human waste is a danger. And you're putting that raw sewage in the ground. That's what a pit toilet, uh, what an outhouse does, but it's contained. They you use treatments on them if you're just burying it. You don't, and it's got a building over it usually. Dogs, other animals will dig that up if it's not deep enough. So if you do bury it, bury it deep and find out where you're going to do that before you have to do it. Because you don't want to be hauling around five gallon bucket of uh, sewage looking for a place to get rid of it. You want to know these things ahead of time. So scouting out, doing some research is a big part of it. Now I, I stuck in toilet, place, toilet paper replacements. I won't go into that too deep. It's in the, it's in the literature. But you do have options if you run out of toilet paper, if you prepare for it. There's a way to, you basically use rags and have a means of washing them that you keep totally separate from your regular clothes washing. You want to use stainless steel, uh, plastic plunger, uh, they have the plungers for clothes washing that work very well. And as long as you keep that, use some stainless steel tongs to handle them, a stainless steel step-top can to keep them in in the bathroom. Uh, you just take them out and you wash them. Fells and aphtha, a little bleach, and if you can hang them in the sun, that will help sanitize them even more. There's other options if you're at home, won't go into those. Uh, you can add a, you get another bucket or tub, uh, buy one of the mop ringers that custodians use, mount on that bucket, you can get a lot more water out of those clothes before you hang them up to dry. If you can hang them out outside again, the sun and wind is the best method. Otherwise, hang them over the tub. There's not going to be enough water there to hurt the drain. And most of it's going to evacuate even after it drips down. Uh, leave the door open so you get more air circulation. If you're on a, you have a deck or a patio and you don't think they'll get stolen, hang them out there. Personal bathing, what I did, I use, I don't like the sun shower bags. Uh, to me, they're not stout enough. Uh, they're a little awkward. I use a smaller bag, a uh, dromedary from MSR, it's four liter, with a sour shower attachment to it. But anything like that, if you got shower bags, use them. You can make your own out of a bucket if you want to. Uh, it's hard to handle in my opinion, but it can be done. A two and a half gallon bucket would be better in my opinion. If the drains aren't working, you got to look at some options. You could, if you're in a position where you can have one of the shelters, like Rob put up for the, for the toilet, you can do a shower in there outside on your patio, even on your deck, if you're careful where that water goes. If you can do it in the tub, if you lay down a piece of plastic, do it better than I did. That did not work very well for me, where I was going to gather up all this shower water, only, only about uh, less, less than a gallon of it. The man, that sucker swarmed on me, and I had water all over me and the floor and everything else. So, but if you can put a stopper in it, you have a 12-volt power system, you can get a, a small marine-type uh, bilge, bilge pump and pump that into one of those uh, uh, gray water totes. And that will allow you to actually get in the tub and contain that water much better. That comes up to uh, uh, something else comes up a little, a little more. Uh, if you have a small kiddie pool, 
can't use the tub because it's got a water bob in it full of water. You have a little kitty tub in the middle of the living room and you can take a shower there. Catch that water, drain it off, either by hand or with that pump. When all comes down to it, uh, if you are going to do a shower, do the Navy shower. Uh, you Navy guys know what that is, probably most of the military. What you do, you open up the valve on the shower bag, you get yourself good and wet, you soap up, uh, put the shampoo in your hair, work it in, then you turn the water, you turn the water back on and rinse off. You don't leave the water running. You do it in two or three steps to conserve water. If you're really limited on water and you really have a hard time going to capture that water from a shower, just do a sponge bath. Uh, that'll help keep you clean and fresh. Uh, keep the place clean. Even if you only got, can use a broom, even on carpets, that's better than not keeping it clean. Uh, now, I'm a big advocate on communications and warning of NOAA weather warning radios. I have a Oregon Scientific sitting on my TV that's on 24-7. And they test it every Wednesday if there's not a storm, so I know it's working. And when the bad weather comes through, the ice storms, the, the blizzards, the heavy snow, I know about it. I know about it anyway because I'm watching Weather Channel most of the time. But when that power goes off, that radio still works. So you've always got one. And if you get one, a good one that is hand cranked, even if you've got one of the ones that run on AC and it does, does go dead or you have to leave, uh, have one that's uh, got a light in it and the same uh, S-A-M-E, which is the a special warning system that they use that and the alert system so even if the radio is just turned off that alarm will sound on that crank up there are a few like that you have to really look for those but that's if power goes off or you have to bug out I the, some of you I'm sure have a, a scanner a public service band scanner that's a good way to keep up on what's going on although it needs to be one set up for a trunked system and uh, like the guy asked me one time when I told him what's the trunk got to do with it, well, you don't, a uh, car trunk has nothing to do with it. It's a method of communication where they bounce the signal around on different frequencies. So it takes a special scanner for some of our local uh, public service people. Also, if you're more than one of you, I have them anyway, there's just one of me, but uh, one of the handheld walkie-talkies, FRS, GMRS, MERS, 2 meter, 70 centimeter amateur uh, is a good CB AM single sideband radio. But those, if you're in the apartment, but those, you start getting into antennas that uh, get a little awkward to put up in an apartment and they aren't very effective inside. There are some that you can use if you want to monitor CB channels. So uh, just whatever you can figure out there. Best method is HF amateur radio for long distance stuff, but the antennas pretty much eliminate that, especially talking. You can receive, you can receive shortwave signals, but only the strong ones. Okay, backup power systems for communication. And we'll talk about that later, kind of like right now. Uh, the, there aren't too many power options available. Fuel type, liquid fuel, generators, you really don't want them in the apartment for sure, inside the apartment. Even on decks and patios, you're running the risk of everybody, their brother and three aunts and a couple of uncles knowing about it. So you're going to draw attention to yourself, which is not a good thing. Even the quiet ones like the, the Honda i-Series, they are very quiet. You run one of those, haven't you? They are very quiet, but you set it on a wooden deck. Go ahead. Rob, is yours 2,000 watts? It is. And, and it's, it's enough for... It's enough for the house, but it, it still is going to make a noise that everybody's going to be aware yeah. of. Yeah. And if you set it out on a deck, like my, my, uh, my deck, it's wooden, that thing is going to vibrate, and it is going to sound three times louder than it would sitting on the ground or on a concrete base. If you can do it, 
you'll probably get thrown out if we're using it and practicing with it. Uh, just simple power failures. If it comes to uh, push comes to shove and you've got one in the storage building somewhere, I'd probably fire that sucker up. But you gotta watch out about the fuel. That's the, that's the limiting factor, not the, not the generator. Storing liquid fuels inside an apartment building is not the thing to do. You're just not gonna be able to store enough safely to have more than a few hours running. One of the Honda 2000 watt generators, a couple, maybe five gallons, or preferably a couple of two and a half gallons, would let you run for a little while. It's not something I'm recommending, it's just something you can think about and decide for yourself in your situation. Now if you have, a, I have a small 12 volt system, I use a, a battery jump starter packet that I ran my computer on uh, when I was doing the earthquake drill. And it worked okay, but you can put together a much better system and uh, that is a fairly specialized. We had uh, some good information on solar systems already, so I won't go into it. But since we are a group, I would like to mention power pole connectors for all of your 12 volt connections. I have a crimper and I have some of the connectors to, if anybody wants to see what I'm talking about. But if uh, Aries and uh, Race races and several other organizations have standardized on those and it really makes switching a piece of equipment from inside the house to the vehicle if they're all on all have these connectors you just plug and plug and play everything matches you can plug anything in that meets the uh, the fuse limits of whatever wiring you have set up you can use solar panels to recharge maybe if you have a south facing window or a south facing deck i'm on the north i face north into an atrium i don't do solar panels it just doesn't work because i just don't get enough sun it's also the reason i don't have a container garden not enough sun so you can look at one of those and you can build a pretty good one keep it charged up uh, if you have a couple of really good batteries you could last for several days the those automobile jump start battery packs, they aren't deep cycle batteries, so they do have limited life for continuous draw. Fire options. You really don't want open flames in an apartment unless it's a stove. And if it's winter time and you're the, the regular heat is off because it's electronically controlled, <coughs> you've got to be very careful about a gas stove, about running it inside because You've generally got the house all closed up. You will suffocate yourself, die from uh, carbon monoxide poisoning and or lack of oxygen. And the worst thing you can do if you actually, a lot of places do allow you to have a charcoal grill on your patio, do not bring that inside. If you can cook on it outside, that's fine. That's a good way to cook. Even with my brother cooks on them with, and standing in four feet of snow on his. So it uh, does a real good job too. Man, he's a good cook. Uh, but if you bring a charcoal grill inside, chances are you're gonna die, pure and simple. I can't put it any more strongly than that, that it is just too big a risk because once that carbon monoxide starts accumulating and the oxygen level starts dropping, your ability to think goes right out that closed window. Uh, and you don't realize what's happening and you just sit there and die. Cooking options. Like I said, if you got a grill on the outside, on the patio, that's a good way to do it. You can do a camping stove, uh, two burner, single burner. Uh, one like I have is uh, my liquid fuel, multi-fuel camping stove. That if you're careful with it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be a danger of using an open flame like that. Now, you can actually cook on those. Uh, if you get some wild game, whatever, you can uh, cook that or just heat up. Most of the stuff you will have cooking will, will not be fresh. It will be your storage foods. So uh, just being able to heat hot water sometimes is enough. 
and less dangerous and easier to store are three products I've found. Sterno, everybody knows about that, I imagine. They use that in hotels, motels, homes, everywhere. That unless you have 20 cans going in a three-foot room, you're not going to have a problem with the, uh, with the fumes or anything. There's also Echo Fuel, ECO, and Heat Cell. These are all gelled fuel stoves. They aren't good for scratch cooking, but you can, you can keep food hot and you can warm up enough water for a hot drink. Lighting, I use crank flashlights and lanterns. If you have a workable DC power system, you can do those. Candles, if you're going to use them, have a very sturdy white base base and use a hurricane chimney on it. It's, they're too dangerous to have with the danger of being knocked over. If you got kids, don't use them at all. Use an alternative. Catalytic for heating, uh, you, that's, that's the hard one. There are catalytic, propane catalytic heaters and some kerosene heaters that are inside safe, but all the same precautions apply that you have to monitor them. You, have, you need desperately a CO and a CO2 monitor in the building or in the apartment that is working. So if you do use those, uh, do it sparingly. If you need to close off everything, just one room. If you have to do the old uh, blanket tent fort. Uh, put all your freezables in there and around your chair and direct that heat right in a limited area to keep things from freezing. Don't worry about the rest of the house. Stuff that don't freeze, if it freezes, who cares? Uh, keep yourself warm and one way to do that with the cooking is to be able to have hot drinks and a hot meal from time to time. Uh, that goes along with a set of long johns and a good sweater if the heat's off that you can manage with very little additional heat. Defense, uh, there's less space to protect it usually in an apartment. Limited access in an apartment building, I can if I chose to, block the elevator and the stairs very easily in my apartment building. So people are, can't get to me on the third floor. How do you do that? Well, if you're tricky, you put a bar across the, uh, the handle on the door, on the stair door, and on the elevator you get it to the top, to your floor, put a chair in it, put a chair in the doorway. So it, can't close. If you can't close, it won't move. Now they can climb up that stairwell if they can get the bottom doors open, but I don't think in the middle of a riot people are going to be doing that. So it's something you have to think about later, but it's one way to isolate yourself for a little while. Uh, if you're outside access, uh, they have full access to you, but not everybody and their brother can see them. And if you've got an alarm system of some kind, you know they're trying to get in. If you can get night vision, do it. But get the good stuff, the cheap stuff. Doesn't work nearly as well, and you want something that will work. I won't go into firearms. That's been covered. People, y'all pretty much know what you need. Now, I have an alarm system. It's, I have a Dakota Alert MERS radio, and I... Uh, PIR motion detector, passive infrared motion detector. I can set that there by my door, have my radio on at night there by my bed if something's going on. I don't use it every night. If something's going on, I will set it up. And if anything happens, uh, that door shakes or tries to move or anything, it will send a signal to my radio that will wake me up and tell me that there is somebody doing something. So. That's uh, something you don't have to wire up, you don't have to plug it in, you don't have to, you just change the batteries once in a while. Okay. Fire safety. If you're not on the first floor or above the third, get the fire escape ladder. Keep the smoke, CO, and CO2 alarms checked regularly. Have a lid, a large lid by your stove that you can grab to put on a pan that might have a grease fire. Keep uh, baking soda, not powder. Uh, you really don't want to use baking powder. Use the baking soda. Uh, you can keep a box of that handy for grease fires. But a lot of the, like a lot of skillets when you're cooking, you don't have a lid that even fits it. But get a large, 
fairly lightweight lid that you can grab and put on any any pan or skillet if you're deep frying in a in a big pot something that will fit that if that grease catches on fire fire extinguishers you want them uh, you need to learn how to use them if you don't really know there are tricks of the trade to using a fire extinguisher that'll be a, some other class at some point in time I won't go into it uh, but what I will go into the little one pounders they're better than nothing but they often get you in more trouble than you started with two and a half pounders are marginal but those are better most people can handle them five pounders almost everybody can handle those ten pounders is getting to the limit of usability I wouldn't mess with twenty pounders not enough your one maybe one person in the house might be able to use them uh, and most of the fires in an apartment you're going to catch quick and put out quick so the 20 pounder is not that much more advantage over a 10 pounder medical and first aid we covered that uh, several times with Rob and plus our other instructors tools hardware and cordage this comes down uh, again for some of the hardware to the ropes and stuff to get your gear up the stairs it also includes the plastic sheeting duct tape the other elements you need for uh, biological and chemical isolation that you can uh, set up one room as a safe room uh, basic hand tools you might need pliers wrenches a basic uh, kitchen drawer toolkit is usually enough you can have some Gorilla Tape, some 550 cord, tie rye, stuff listed here uh, if you want. S spares, you want a lot of consumables. Just like your food and everything else, more is better. You want plenty of batteries. You don't want to have one set of spare batteries for that radio. You want a bunch. Now, bugging out. That is going to happen more often from an apartment than it will a house because you have a lot more apartments in a house I mean not a lot more options in a house uh, there are additional reasons that I've already covered the sewer in the uh, in the first floor the hauling water up all of those factors go into leaving or staying those are, you have to consider all of those uh, if you won't go into the legalities of being made if you're told to leave you probably better leave uh, so bugging out needs to be uh, a portion of any apartment livers preparations okay uh, fold up cart or bicycle fold up bicycle especially in an apartment with uh, inline trailer those can carry enough gear to get you somewhere very effective on having what you need uh, you might even consider a uh, inch bag to take off with in case it's going to be something long term that's another again that's another subject now short range you can go to friends family motel city park if you have camping gear you do need to have it you can add some campgrounds to the list if it's medium range of bug out or long range it's tougher you might need that inch bag okay gardening in an apartment I did not go into details because I'm a long way from a master gardener uh, is it acceptable in your building it happens to be in mine in the in the courtyard we can do it uh, can you set one up and will they let you uh, do you have a decker patio there are weight limits to what you can grow on a on a wooden deck but if you they will allow you mine does it you can't have stuff like that on the decks uh, <clears throat> can you contain or grow on your deck allowed or bootleg it's a decision you have to make like our building they're in there on a regular basis they know they're going to know that you're doing it and if it's not allowed it'll cause you problems again it comes back to the same thing with uh, solar solar panels do you have enough sun to do any gardening can you use window boxes can you use uh, window greenhouses all of these things listed here are aspects of whether or not you can do some gardening to supplement your stored food and it's it's going to be building specific every time 
Uh, any questions on what I covered? Or yeah. Question for you: um, Have you, or do you have an uh, the escape for the silk electric fires? I know it's really prominent in the East Coast, not so much here in the West. But no, I don't. It's something I would like to get, but at the moment I can't afford. Have you looked at them? You yes, I have. To have. They are reasonable to have now. They didn't used to be. The one, the older ones, were not as effective. Uh, they weren't as well made. There are some good ones on the market now, and I do plan on getting one. But again, I'm living on a budget as well as in an apartment, so some of that, uh, it takes time to accumulate things. But it is one of the things that I should get fairly quickly because fire is a factor. We, we do have sprinklers, so I'm less worried about fire than I would be in some buildings, but it's always a risk. Anybody else? Um, on the motion detector, is it sensitive where if a cat goes by your front door, would it set it off? If you've got it, not not outside the door, no. Oh, okay. That door would have to be forced to move enough, or if somebody was able to come in the patio door quietly, mm -hmm. then, which is not likely, the way I've got things set up, but any movement within its range, but it's not going to do it outside the door. Now, if you got it sitting on the floor, a cat going across it will set it off. Uh, now, you want to set it in a position where that's not likely to happen. But that goes with any of the PIR uh, security stuff. Anybody else? Jerry, sure. uh, two more things, guys. Um, you know, it's for me when I lived in an apartment. I, I hate to say it, I keep living on a budget coming back from an deployment. My alarm system was a glass beer bottle on the doorknob. We actually caught a guy in my apartment <coughs> complex. His whole thing was to go by him. Mm -hmm. See which door was left unlocked when we went to work. We rattled that thing. It's from that one movie with Mel Gibson. You shake the door out, the bottle will fall off. You're in your apartment. Like, what was that? You know, so because they were checking just to see the apartment. And the other thing I had in my car, my staircase, like for some of it, Jerry, because you can't climb down the side of the metal rail, my staircase to my apartment door, because I was an outside apartment, was cement steps. So I kept the sledgehammer behind my door. So then if people were rioting or looting outside, I would smash out my stairs. So they just can't come up to your apartment. But if I had to get up and down, I would climb on the railing on the side. You know, because I kind of think about stuff like Jerry does all the time. I'm always thinking, what can I do? What can I do differently? Yeah, the other thing is with the plastic for the house, Jerry, like Jerry said, is I suggest people get the black plastic. Because if they are rioting and looting outside, you want to blacken out your living area, if it's a house or an apartment. If you're, if so, because in the military, I said this before, they taught us that a cherry of a cigarette can be seen a mile away in the dark. You know, so if they see your candle, your crank radio, the flashlights. Hey, why are they still there? You know, he must have supplies. He must have food. They'll find a way to get to you. To get to stuff. So, uh, are the, the black contractor bags that's enough to black them out? Yeah, just get that black Vis cream rolls, ten dollar roll at Home Depot. Well, right I, in my house. I prefer to use the clear plastic for the for the walls because it's a lighter and it, it, it's not going to make it as dark but the pla black plastic for the windows is uh, that that is good because you do want to black out I in some situations okay, now, but what are you talking about with the, for the walls though the regular uh, uh, painters plastic or heavier duty uh, you tape it to the ceiling to the walls you seal all the joints you make a, you fix up a double layer at the door. You cover all of your wiring outlets, your switch plates, your ventilator, your air conditioning vents, and you have try to get a fairly sealed room. You have to make allowances for ventilation, but there are ways there are ways to do that. It's a little complex. I can't really get into it. That's a separate subject. Uh, but you can get a room that you can be safe in for a while if there is something going around. Uh, it's also good to set up if you have a sick room. If there's a pandemic going on, you want a sick room where anybody that is sick stays in that room. You want to do that to avoid the spread. Okay, yes? Uh, one of the things about stoves is camp stoves make a lot of noise. They do, they so they're roars. They're great uh, luxury hat on alcohol stoves as a secondary option. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same in the same vein of not being in, a, in apartment living, 
uh, not you know being as as as, as low key and, and as uh, low visibility as possible. Yeah. Um, I've I've been using Camtos for many many years, and they're all enormously loud. Yeah. Um, and they they roar. Like jet going off. Yep. But uh, the alcohol stuff is something I've been looking into because of the quiet yeah. aspect. Of it. And they are available. Again, they're like the Sterno, and the other heat cells are usually pretty small. They're good for heating up water. I don't want to cook a a three-course meal on one, but they they all have their uses, and they are relatively safe because of the way alcohol burns. Yeah. And the comment about uh, cooking uh, uh, with the, the freeze dried was actually very interesting because uh, you don't have if you're if all your option is is that alcohol stove you want to just heat water up and that's your big that's your way of making the food. That's also mm -hmm. a really interesting point as far as al uh, apartment uh, living. Yeah, uh, and in winter time, it is critical to have warm food and warm drinks to help keep you warm. Anybody else? Um, I wanted to mention on the shower. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you get a, because I hate those bags. Yeah, those I, I know. And stuff. Um, if you get a bug sprayer, you know, brand new yep. bug sprayer, that you can pump it up. It has more pressure. You can use it as a shower. And if you paint it black, you can set it out in the sun and it'll warm it up. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to. And yep. then it's still clean water. So. Yep, that's a very good. That's a very good option. Uh, it just, and you can modify the sprayer so it works a lot better than just with the normal bug spray head. But it's not too hard to do. There's videos on the internet on how to how to set those up. It just takes. It's one of the things that takes up a little space that I chose not to do. Yeah. Okay. More stuff. To uh, to, to hide your totes, uh, blankets, quilts, and other decorative. Uh, mm -hmm things is a great option um, and yep. then you look all cool because you've got the, these, these pretty things you know, you're like you're upscale so, yeah, so i'm just saying you know, it's, it's a, you know, if, if you've got this really nice uh, you know little rug over there you know then that's just a really nice little rug uh, and then i'll have to know what's underneath it yeah it look like it the end of well okay well i'm just saying, I'm just saying. So well, it's also important for for you know like in an apartment hey my you know toilet's back come come fix it mm -hmm. you've got you know workmen walking through your apartment yeah um, all they see is a, is a is a nice rug. They don't see a tote and wonder to themselves, well, what's yeah. those totes? Or you know, some of them. some of my totes, my sister, because I watched uh, Popeye when I was a little kid. She made me a Popeye fleece blanket. Sweet. Uh, I mean, I'm 60 years old. And I have a Popeye blanket. <laughs> which, uh, it would not have been my first choice, but God, I love that sister. Uh, anyway, that's kind of covering that's kind of covering some of my totes. I I do do that, but since I went on television to show off my stuff, uh, pretty much everybody in the building knows. So it's not as big as a a deal for me because I am so out there that people know. Well, no more questions. That's all I've got. Thank you, brother. Ah.